So if you uh, could put all your, which are probably Huawei phones, on silent um, for, this, uh, for this press conference. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen here in the room, uh, and welcome to this press conference from the 12th annual meeting of the new champions uh, here in Tianjin, China. And uh, a good morning to our uh, audience, uh, which might join us from Europe uh, as of now as well on the live stream. Uh, um, welcome uh, to you as well. You're joining a press conference on the digital transformation of enterprises. And uh, the purpose of, uh, of this press conference is to discuss what are the, what are the challenges, what are the roads to success for uh, companies to get ready for the digital transformation, to go through digital transformation. It's also dedicated uh, to the launch uh, uh, of a report that the World Economic Forum is launching here today together uh, with Bain and company on uh, that exact same topic. Uh, I'm very pleased to present to you today a wonderful uh, panel to discuss these questions uh, with us. Uh, to my immediate left, I'm joined uh, by my colleague Helena Laurent, who's the head of government engagement and a member of the executive committee of the World Economic Forum, and I should add in this context, leads the forum's work on the future of production. Um, so I know many of you have written articles in the last days about the, the best factories in the world, three of which are actually based here in China. So uh, very happy to have you here. Helena, right at the heart and center of our panel, uh, we are joined uh, by Uriel Longri, who's a partner at uh, Bain and & Company and uh, has been, uh, let's say, essential I think it's fair to say to, the, to this report, but also to the work of uh, the um, World Economic Forum in general on, on digital transformation. Uh, further down the line next to him, we're joined by Sebastian Herzog, a uh, good chance for me to play out my German accent here to the fullest, <laughs> who's the senior vice president of uh, Axel Springer High based uh, in Germany. And uh, last, but definitely not least, we're joined uh, by Deepak Krishnamurti, a little bit more difficult with the German accent to pronounce, who is the chief strategy officer uh, of SAP uh, based uh, in the US. Without further ado, welcome uh, my fellow panelists. Um, Helena, let me, let me hand over to you. What's the forum, let me ask, just simply ask, what's the forum doing in the space of of digital transformation, and why is that important for an international organization dedicated to public-private partnership? <coughs> wonderful, thank you, Georg. Uh, wonderful to be talking to everyone today. Um, I think we have all established that the fourth industrial revolution is something that needs to be on our agenda. We need to recognize that there is an opportunity uh, to be gained from uh, uh, taking uh, new technologies um, and applying them to uh, explore productivity. The big question, of course, is how to do that. So um, the, the fourth industrial revolution is on everybody's minds, it's on everybody's lips, it's a source of conversation. How do we go from uh, talking about this to actual application in our factories, in our companies? So one of the exciting things that actually uh, my colleague Derek O'Halloran is in the, in the front row here, um, he has been working on for some time, is to think about digital disruption and digital transformation, to explore that in the context of a range of different industries, to recognize that opportunity and quantify the opportunity, not just for business, but from a societal and environmental standpoint, and say, what, what does this really look like? And then the most recent piece of work, and this is the, the rather wonderful report I would encourage everyone to look at, done in collaboration with uh, our colleagues from Bain. Um, this is then the blueprint for how. And this was done over the, the past year. Uh, we tend to, to draw from our broader stakeholder network. So this is you know, cross industry. Uh, it draws on chief strategy officers. It draws on chief digital officers. Um, and then puts together, well, if you are a CEO now thinking about the fourth industrial revolution, what actually are the next steps? Um, we lay those out. I think uh, you will talk about those steps a little bit more and how we came to those conclusions. Um, for us, though, Georg, you asked, well, how do we then use that? 
we see this as incredibly important because once you start moving down this track, once you start on that journey, you of course discover that you cannot do that alone. This comes from, again, the cross-industry collaboration, uh, the uh, recognition that need, there needs to be a conversation between business and government, um, the, the broader range of stakeholders who need to be involved. And so I think the, the goal of the, the team uh, uh, is now to put together what we call communities of, of practice or purpose. These are communities that say, you know, how are we going to enter into the fourth industrial revolution? Revolution, go beyond what in our production work we call pilot purgatory, uh, go into really seeing the productivity gains that we know are out there. Um, and that's going to be a very exciting uh, next step for us. We're looking forward to, to supporting that uh, in, a, in, a, in a sort of the search for inclusive and sustainable growth. Thank you very much, uh, Helena. Real Helena already mentioned that uh, you will give us a bit more a deep dive into the report and for those of you who didn't catch it the first time I'll show it I'll show it once more it's also available as of now on our website so please go download the report read it um, and, and and look at it Riel from your perspective um, what are the key findings of the report and what are your personal highlights uh, of the report it's hard to summarize a, a year worth of work in a, in a few minutes, but I'll try and I'll try to keep it brief. Um, you know, probably the first thing is that uh, experimentation is easy, but transformation is hard. Um, and that's probably been the biggest challenge for the companies uh, on the panel and the companies that we worked with uh, over the course of the last year. Um, a lot of companies find themselves stalled when it comes to transformation. And that's because of the, the tension that all of them experience um, in their management teams, on their boards of directors, uh, between the people we grew to call uh, dreamers and doers. Uh, the, the dreamers are the people who imagine the car. And the uh, doers are the people who are trying to, uh, to build a, a cheaper, a better, a faster horse. And, um, <laughs> And they're at odds with each other, and as a result, it's hard to move forward. And so one, uh, one idea that the, the, the group came up with was the idea of uh, thinking about uh, strategy and thinking about a roadmap in two opposite but very complementary um, uh, directions. Uh, present forward, that's the way of, of the doers. That's the uh, cheaper, better, faster horse, but also future back. Um, where's the industry going to go in, in 10 or 20 years, and how do we uh, lay out steps that move us uh, in that direction? And then the last thought I'll, I'll leave you with is uh, stepping stones. Um, the, uh, a lot of companies basically, they didn't call them stepping stones, but when they described their approach, they were effectively moving along stepping stones. And what that means is not that you take it a step at a time, but rather what it means is that uh, you don't see step two until you take step one. And you've got to be comfortable with that, and you've got to rewire the enterprise in terms of ways you make decisions, ways you fund programs, um, in order to, uh, to move along those stepping stones. Thank you. Thank you, Uriel. Sebastian, let me, let me get to you. Um, I, I should probably manage before I ask my question to you is that uh, you work for Axel Springer High, which is um, part of but not the uh, uh, global publishing house uh, you're, you're, you might be familiar with, but it's uh, basically a consulting arm of that. So maybe if you give us two, two or three sentence background on, on Axel Springer High. But my question to you would also be is um, with, with the clients you work with, with the people uh, who come to you for, for, for input, um, uh, how far are most uh, removed from that transformation phase that Uriel mentioned? How many are still in that experimentation phase? Well, <clears throat> let me answer that uh, last part of the question first. I believe um, you can take the Gartner hype cycle for the whole topic of, of transformation. So we meet people and NCOs that are at the beginning, so they haven't done anything at all. They just realize, and that also happens in 2018, that digital is now on their agenda. Um, so they are in the very beginning, and they just want to experiment. Um, but we also work with clients, they have the feeling they have done everything, they've done startup investments, they've launched an accelerator, launched an incubator, 
played around with some APIs, did a hub, did a lab, did a garage, whatever, and then the CEO looks back and said, hey, by the way, my colleague in the board, the CFO guy, he just uh, made a thumb of all the money we invested over those three, four years, and we have the feeling that apart from PR, marketing, and some fancy stuff, there's not the real, the real impact. Um, and they come to us and say, okay, what is the real thing? And that's why I believe why also the, the report which uh, you brought up and just the discussion we had earlier on today is, is so important because I believe if you are serious about digital transformation, then it is really about making impact and having a clear goal of driving business. So I believe at the end, it all has to come back to either increase revenue and with that also increase your, increase your profit. If you do not have that ambition, um, it ends up with... Um, was playing a lot. So long answer, but uh, we see a company with the full range of, of where they are. Um, I think all of those companies have the feeling that the time to experiment kind of needs to be limited. And uh, this is what, um, coming back to, to what Springer also realized. Like Springer made a significant transformation over 12 years, completely transforming the company from one media house to now a portfolio of actually 700 companies, two of them, 200 of them direct investments. And that changed a lot in terms of structure, governance, but also then changed a lot of, uh, of leadership things. And, and they were very, very serious. That was a big bet, and now it's like 12 years down the road. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Deepak, um, your title is Chief Strategy Officer, but we spoke briefly before and you mentioned that a lot of the work you do is actually directly tied to innovation activities that, that SAP do. So um, can you talk a little bit about that and uh, how a company of, of the size of SAP um, is thinking about innovation both for itself but also for the, for the companies you work with? Yeah, uh, the idea of innovation is probably uh, broad-based, right? It's no longer about just one small unit in an organization focusing on innovation. So there are different models of innovation. The things that you do continuously improve on what you do, and that's still innovation. And the stuff that you need to do that dramatically changes who you are, that is probably transformative innovation or disruptive innovation. So, so from a strategy perspective, uh, we focus on both areas. And uh, starting off, like now, I would say, like seven years back, when SAP realized that the future needs to be digital and it's going to be cloud, mobile, big data, we took an, uh, an ambitious goal of like how do we transform ourselves from a company that was very successful for 30, 40 years as a software company in the on-premise perpetual licensing world to a cloud company that's going to focus on on new business models on on subscription-based revenues. So the idea of transformation and around innovation aligns with also what uh, the report also talks about. It's around three big things from my perspective. One is around the business model transformation. So you have to go and transform your business model that's aligned to a mission of the company. And in our case, the mission was helping our customer run better and driving customer success. So as long as you align your business model transformation to the goal of your customers, in this case around delivering a software as a service that delivers better outcome for your customers, you have a good chance of succeeding in your business model innovation. The second component was all about product innovation. That's where technology comes into play. Now, people confuse digital transformation with technology all the time. To me, technology is probably the least important aspect of digital transformation, but the most overhyped aspect of the digital transformation. But technology is important. You still need to figure out how do you go and build the next generation platform. I think the world's gone from what I would call the industrial automation era to business process automation to digital transformation over the last 40 years. And we are at the precipice of intelligent automation or the new AI, the fourth industrial revolution coming in. So everything that's digital is going to be much more intelligent going forward. And companies need to be ready for it, need to have the technology backbone and infrastructure to be ready for it. And SAP has been doing it internally, but also helping our customers do it. The third piece is probably the hardest one, which is around cultural transformation. And it's, it's like, you know, the, the report talks about it from a governance perspective. I think the cultural transformation is probably the most important part of a digital transformation story. And that's the one that's hardest to do. So it goes back to uh, some of the things that we talked about earlier, York, which is how do you go transform a company in terms of both the digital dreamers and the doers, and also infuse it as a part of the, the DNA of the company. So in our case, it was all about going and, and trying to go create an open ecosystem, uh, investing in startups. My team runs a small uh, innovation function that is 
focus on early stage investments in startups, something called SAP.io, slightly different from what we do traditionally, but the idea is to go invest in interesting companies that can be part of the ecosystem because no company can do it all by, the, by themselves. And finally, it's also about like, DNA, right? So sometimes like, you can't have the DNA in-house, so you might want to do really smart acquisitions to bring the DNA in-house so that sometimes you've got to learn from the acquired companies that have the DNA of doing things differently. So making some smart acquisitions, investing in uh, M&A to the extent that's possible as, from a capital structure perspective helps in transforming the DNA. And you've got to bring in the people that are part of the acquired companies to the leadership team so that they take the DNA and transform the company's culture. So it's a multifaceted way to go drive innovation. There's no one way to do it. But as long as you are consistent across the business model, the product and technology, and the culture, then you'll be as, at least have a chance to be successful in digital transformation. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a wonderful bridge to my, to my next uh, question, Deepak. Um, the three of you, you have to basically think about these things faster than your clients, right? That's why, that's why companies come to you and, and ask for your advice. Um, and you mentioned briefly the people. And I'd be curious to hear uh, your thoughts on skill and talent. Um, with the technologies developing so fast, how can you keep up um, both as the companies you mentioned here, but also at your own companies to, to get these people on board and, and get them ready to, to do these transformations, lead these transformations? And what might be the biggest challenges? So uh, today, like you from a technology perspective, like everybody talks about a huge skills gap in technology, right? So in terms of like having the right digital skills, like skills in AI, machine learning, IoT, all of these are big skills gap. I think there's an opportunity to do some retraining, reskilling. There's an also opportunity to bring in uh, an external workforce that is flexible enough that you can manage. There's an opportunity to create an ecosystem of partners that, can, you, that you can work with. There are all opportunities to go and bridge the skills gap. I think skills is one thing. It's like, you, know, you, can, you can hire a few hundred uh, like Python programmers who are building machine learning algorithms, but if they're not doing the right product, if they're not building the right uh, outcome for the customers, it's never going to be successful. So having an understanding of the business outcomes that you want to achieve and marrying that with the technology skills that, that you need to either hire or retrain is going to be critical. That's what we see broadly. Like it's, it's a, there's always a big gap and challenge with respect to hiring more and more data scientists. You can, I've seen more data science projects fail than succeed. In fact, like probably I've seen like seven out of 10 fail and maybe three out of 10 succeed. And most of these data science projects, they're all stuck in some kind of what I call uh, a prototype proof of concept uh, hole, right? So that's kind of the, where they are in. It's really hard to scale them because it ends up being a nice proof of concept, a shiny object, but never you cannot transfer that to the core DNA and the core business model of the company. And that's where the challenge is. Mm. Thank you. You want to add to that? <clears throat> yeah, I fully agree. And I would, I would add that um, my, like my hypothesis is that uh, mindset will always beat skill set. Um, which means exactly what you said. It's not like software is the least important part of transformation, and skills are the least important part of the whole cultural cultural aspects. So I believe instead of trying to retrain the whole organization, and instead of trying to tell your employees that they need to change, um, I would rather change the the incentive structure, change the rules how a company actually works. So um, Springer actually did a very very. Um, aggressive way of doing that. They eliminated corporate careers 100%. That means um, when Springer started to actually follow those 200 direct investments and startup investments, etc., they said, okay, if we do that, uh, we have to make sure that all the perks and benefits that are usually on the corporate level, not on the startup level, that needs to be completely turned around. So at the moment, it's more attractive to work in a subsidiary of Springer than it is to work at the corporate level. On the other hand, like all the people taking care of the investments, they don't have a carry on their investments. Why? Because if you have the carry, you go for the corporate role. So if you want to make a career at Springer, now you have to, as, as we did, you have to found your own company. You have to like put, put your money where your mouth is and really become an entrepreneur. So Springer actually took every single department and asked themselves whether that could be a company. And if the answer was yes, they literally sized and seized the company down into a huge portfolio of different, uh, different legal entities, having an MD of that company being part and being owner of, of your own company. And that is very, like I'm, I'm working with one of those sister companies and it's very, very interesting to be in such an entrepreneurial mindset. And that changed the whole company, it changed the whole structure and culture. Mm. So I just fully agree. 
Uriel, that sounds to me a little bit like the problem sometimes lies with the C-suite level in companies when the transformation fails. Would you agree? Putting you a little bit on the spot here. <laughs> I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's a really tough challenge to get your arms around. I think there is a, there's a reason why it is so hard to find uh, an incumbent that has transformed uh, fully. Um, and it's not just the old uh, you know, innovators dilemma. It's also that I think over time, not just C-suites, but companies that have convinced themselves that uh, the product that they serve is the same thing as the raw need that they're supposed to, uh, to answer. Uh, and that's not the case. Our view is that the, uh, the product is temporary and that the raw need is, is permanent and that you need to have the courage to go out there and rediscover that raw need and um, and come up with innovation, you know, freeing yourself from today's product, freeing yourself from today's customer experience and even the economic model. And that's not just a C-suite, that's everybody. Frankly, I mean, you could argue that the financial markets are pretty shy in accepting uh, large companies uh, transforming themselves. You know, they'd much rather you keep doing what you do, that's safe, and then they'll invest in somebody else if they want something else. Patience is not uh, a strong suit, no. yes, I would agree. Thank you very much. I've been very selfish in asking uh, a, a lot of questions. Um, we, of course, have a lot of members of the media in the room. Um, we have microphones here. If you could, uh, if I could see a show of hands, if you have any questions. No, that gives me the opportunity to, uh, to get in one of my questions again. Now, the, there's this old saying that doctors are the worst patients. Now, we've spoken a little bit about the companies you advise and you work with, um, but let's talk a little bit uh, about your own companies. Um, is it true that doctors are the worst patients? Um, and um, Basically, what, fr from the work you do, we've done for the report, uh, all the case studies you've seen here, what are you taking also as a learning to your own company? That, uh, this is a question to all of you. Who wants to go first? Uriel, you're I'm, at the I'm center of the panel. Start. Yeah, I'm happy to start. Um, so one of the things that uh, we talk a lot about in the report is how um, in, in a digital economy, being easy to do business with, being a good partner, uh, becomes a really important source of competitive advantage because uh, more and more you can't do everything alone and so you need partners around you and you need to be easy to do business with. Um, I, I come from a, from a company, a Bain company, that um, has a very strong culture and we're, you know, we're, we're very good at what we do but we have to work with more and more companies from different walks of life and so one thing that, that we're working on, I think we're making a, a ton of progress on that, is uh, to learn how to work with a much larger ecosystem of partners, to be a lot easier to do business with. And uh, despite the fact that we have a very well-traveled way to deliver our work, uh, we are able to work productively with uh, third parties hmm. that might not be uh, a part of the same culture or have learned the same uh, uh, set of tricks for how to deliver value to a, to a client. Yeah, so uh, I would say like, you know, average doctors are really bad patients, but good doctors end up being good patients. So I would imagine that uh, like a company like SAP is, uh, will, will eat its uh, like, you know, own dog food, drink its own champagne any day, right? So I think the uh, jokes apart, uh, the idea of of uh, transforming digitally is, is not an option anymore. I think it's like you know, any company and every company that's, that's living in the marketplace today, we all know that what's happening in the outside world. It's, it's the pace of change is incredible. Uh, there's, uh, any, any day there's like a new competition coming up, uh, if, if not in, in the core home market, like from China, which is probably one of the most disruptive economies. So uh, companies like SAP, uh, Bain, every other company is challenged by the disruption that's happening from a marketplace. So, and more importantly, customers have choice. The customers have choice more than ever before. So uh, if, uh, if SAP doesn't deliver value to its customers, they're going to look elsewhere. So that gives us the passion and the motivation to go change every day. And, and, and that's the reason why uh, like more and more companies are investing in innovation, both organically and investing in you know, all of these new technologies, but also 
trying to build out an ecosystem and trying to go create a vibrant community that can come together in a, in a very different way. And so I would say uh, I'm, I'm fairly uh, comfortable with where we are. And, uh, like, you know, we could always transform faster, but like, compared to where we were, uh, like we are probably, uh, this year we'll end up with more cloud subscription revenue than our on-premise revenue. So that is a good benchmark for us in terms of a digital transformation. So we are still uh, like Germany's most valuable uh, DAX company. Uh, so it's all of those factors are obviously like, you know, reflecting on, on the growth that we have achieved so far, but we need to do more and to continue pace with the disruption innovation that's happening. Thank you. Um, I think if I, if I look at the report and the four different, different pillars of the study, then I think for, for us, and that counts for Axel Springer as well as for, for us as Axel Springer High, the whole topic around how to orchestrate um, the digital transformation seems to be most relevant. I believe, um, like most companies of us, we are we're good in terms of strategy. We, we have get our head around the business model. Um, so that's, that's kind of set. And, and the enablers, I mean, I talked a lot about the cultural aspect. I think this is something we already have ticked, but how to orchestrate that? Because I believe this is um, something which has a lot to do with the new way of how to deal with leadership. Like I believe the, the old way leadership was done that um, a CEO of a company actually defines the direction and convinces the team to follow, um, whereas the Axel Springer CEO, Matthias Döpfner, he always says, I don't know where the media industry is going, and it's not my role as a CEO to tell everyone. It's my role to organize a company, or to take the term orchestrate a company that actually finds that answer continuously on a daily basis. Same for us. I mean, we are, we are a young company, one and a half years old, and, and we, are, we start in the consulting area, but I would say it's not the role of our CEO to define what the future consulting business looks like. It's our role to again, define a company that, or orchestrate a company that finds that answer on a daily basis. And uh, this is the luxury of being a new market entrant. Um, but uh, yeah, I really uh, like the, the fourth pillar of the report. Yeah, just to build on that, I mean, if you look at the, the very intriguing questions throughout this, I think there were three that really uh, came out for me. One being, how will you act uh, and how will you make progress without being certain of the end game? A complete sort of reversal. Yeah. The other two I thought were really intriguing for organizations to, to ask is, have you imagined a six-star offering in a five-star world? R maintain the level of excellence whilst everything uh, changes around you. And then to your point, have you built a sponsorship spine? I love that concept of sort of where's our backbone as we, as we move into that fourth industrial revolution. And this backbone isn't just from the leader, it's an entire organizational uh, um, uh, uh, change. Yeah, thank you very much. So Matthias Stefner does not know where the media industry is going. I know, however, that our journalists have to be leaving soon. So let's see if we have, a, have uh, any more questions uh, from the audience. Yes, if you could get the microphone there. Um, give us some time maybe to put on the headphones in case you're asking a question in Chinese. Yeah, and if you could state your name and organization for the benefit of our online audience as well, please. OK, uh, thank you. I'm Ling with Taijin Magazine, based in Beijing. So uh, Mr. Lan Langley just mentioned that in the company there are dreamers and doers and they have different opinions with uh, digitalization. So I wonder, do you have an effective way in your daily work to persuade those companies who lack motives to change? And not just tell them that you have to change, but really, I mean, give them incentives to change. So in your daily work, how do you do that? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think the First of all, it's very rare these days to, uh, to meet with management teams in companies that do not want to change. I mean, everybody wants to change. The question is, you know, how much, how fast, where, but not whether, whether you want to change. Now, having said that, the, the value of understanding the, the, this idea of dreamers and doers, and frankly, the value of just saying the words is that you immediately see people turn to each other and laugh and say, well, you're a dreamer and you're a doer and we've known this forever, but we've never had that concept. You know? And so we've never called each other for, you know, by those names. And then when you lay it out and say, listen, the, the, we are moving in the direction of the car, but there'll be stepping stones and if you're a doer, we're going to first uh, we're going to first do you know X to the horse. We're going to take it faster. We're going to add this. We're going to add we're going to add that. And people start to understand that um, 
yeah, we're moving in the direction of the future, but the things we're going to be doing for the next, you know, two, three, five years are going to make sense. They're going to make money. They're going to have a return on investment. Um, and so if you're a doer, you feel good because you're making more money in the next three to five years. And if you're a dreamer, you feel good because you're moving in the direction of a future. You're not just uh, you know, taking incremental steps. Um, that's a pretty relaxing thing and, uh, for, for all the executives involved. But it does require articulating a vision for the future and then working back and saying, what are the things we can do now that move us in the direction? It also requires um, landing the point that even though you're not exactly sure what the end game is, as long as you have a general idea for the direction, you, you've got to get going now. It's not an option to wait until you're 100% sure and then get moving, because by then it's too late. And so it's about you know, general direction of travel, not exact point of arrival. <laughs> Yeah, and maybe uh, one other point I would add is that I think it's super important to over-communicate why you're doing something, and more importantly, what does it mean for the individuals in that organization? Uh, so it's, it's very interesting to talk about disruption, new technologies, new innovation, in an abstract level, but uh, the idea of over-communicating to every single audience in the organization, not just the, the people in the product or the technology function, but HR, finance, recruiting, everything, right? So everybody needs to be in sync and like reiterating the purpose over and over again and trying to translate that at the grassroots level, even though the change is minimal. Just tell people what they should be doing differently tomorrow or the year from now. And that over communication is critical for companies to succeed. Thank you very much. We have one more question from the gentleman in the middle. Microphone is coming. Thank you. Uh, one question is uh, for the SAPs. Because my understanding, SAP really is a software, very famous company, right? Is um, and at this digital age, and uh, my my understanding is uh, SAP is uh, benefit from this because you are trying to push more, you are helping companies to more digitalize, right? And uh, what's what's really from your point of view, what's the digitalization for SAP? And um, is there any challenge? for SAP to engage in this digitalization trend? Yeah, so, so the question is, uh, is, what does it mean for SAP to digitize, digitalize itself? That's, that's, uh, the, and then what are the challenges? Yes. So uh, I, there's multiple challenges uh, when you look at uh, SAP trying to transform itself. So I, I mentioned m and uh, as a way to transform. So, as a, so SAP acquired a number of companies over the last seven years, so integrating cultures, which are global companies, these were all companies in Silicon Valley, Seattle, and other parts of the world, integrating it into one consistent culture, uh, it, it was, was, was something that we did over the last three, four years, and continues to be an ongoing progress. Making sure that we are in touch with the new innovations that's going on in the marketplace, so it could be blockchain, it could be quantum computing, it could be something else, and making sure that SAP is at the forefront of those innovations and taking those innovations and consuming it internally but also for our customers and making it simple for our customers is, is an ongoing uh, learning for us in terms of how we do that better and better. And finally, from a challenge perspective, again, I, I go back to the marketplace. It's a, there's always disruptors, there's always a lot of competition around, and you have to be one step ahead in terms of thinking about what could happen and plan for the future and put that plan in place in terms of innovation. So we created an in, in innovation function that's purely focused on what we call disruptive horizon three innovation. We ring fence the investments, focus on new technologies that are coming in. And that way, that's not focused on driving revenue for the company in the short term, but looking at innovations in the long term and how does SAP be prepared for that long term innovation. Thank you very much. If we don't have any more question, and since we're a Swiss organization, mindful of the time, I would close the press conference here. But I would be amiss not to give a shout out first to Lucy Cummings, who is one of the uh, key authors of the report as well, who's, who's here in the room with us. So thank you for joining as well. And of course, Derek, uh, the, uh, her counterpart from the forum as well, who leads our uh, system work on the digital economy and society. So thank you very much uh, for all of you here in the room, for those of you watching, and a special thank you to all my panelists. Thank you. Thank you.